There are a lot of exciting things going on this month, but I just want to highlight that our online auction runs from February 18th to the 28th, and it has a live Zoom social starting at 4 p.m. on February 28th, featuring the musical stylings of Martin Kerr. And if you haven't heard him, you won't want to miss this. Well, if you have heard him, you know you don't want to miss this, because uh, he is just a lot of fun. And um, so you can continue to put up auction items as a donation or check them out. So on the 18th, when it goes live, you can start placing your bids. You can look without registering. You just need to register to place bids, which we hope you will all do for things that you find uh, beautiful and pleasing in your life. This is a fundraiser for Westwood. There is, as Brenda was saying, a congregational meeting next Saturday, February 20th, beginning at 10 a.m. It's a follow-up to our fall meeting, and we hope to hear from as many of you as possible that day um, as we are just building together on the strengths of this year. There's the invitation to gather for the Let's Sing event on 4 p.m. on February 21st. A new book in the Freethinker Book Club on the evening of February 24th, Sue Monk Kids, The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. There is no reason to be bored or lonely this month. Um, all of the details are on the Westwood website. Some of those things need registration just so that you can get the links to where you're going. Our opening song this morning uh, is played by our beloved Sheila Kaloran. And it is Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. We invite you to sing along. Enter, rejoice, and come in. As we begin this morning, we pause to recognize and appreciate the Treaty 6 First Nations, predominantly Cree peoples upon whose traditional land our Westwood building and many of us gathered here today are fortunate to be situated on. Good morning and welcome to Westwood Unitarian Congregation. At Westwood, we are building a culture where we are gentle with one another, where we value and practice inclusivity, where we support people in solving problems and in addressing communal and individual concerns. My name is Lisa Stein and I am your service leader this morning. Our speaker is Reverend Ann Barker and our musicians are Sheila Kaloran and Rebecca Patterson. We are grateful to be able to meet virtually in the spirit of community and right relations. Although we are not able to meet in our beautiful building, we take this time to share and be with one another. I also bid a special welcome to those of you who are here for the first time or who consider yourselves new to our congregation. In light of our February theme of commitment, we remember that the Sunday service is central to, our, to life in our Westwood community. Worship reminds us of who we are, what we can become, how we want to live, and what we hope to give to the community and to the world. If you have a chalice or a candle nearby, now's a great time to bring it forward. This is our chalice lighting time and we find that lighting candles together helps us to embody the rituals that we would have shared when we're in the building together. Our chalice lighting this morning is the words of UU songwriter Jason Shelton. From the light of days remembered burns a beacon bright and clear, guiding hands and hearts and spirits into faith set free from fear. From the stories of our living rings a song both brave and free, 
calling pilgrims still to witness to the life of liberty. From the dreams of youthful vision comes a new prophetic voice, which demands a deeper justice built by our courageous choice. When the fire of commitment sets our minds and souls ablaze, when our hunger and our passion meet to call us on our way, when we live with deep assurance of the flame that burns within, then our promise finds fulfillment and our future can begin. We light our shared chalices this morning in the spirit of commitment. And don't worry, you will get to sing it at the end. At this time, we pause to reflect on our week. We recall the milestones, joys, concerns, and sorrows, the changes in our lives, and those who need our comfort and healing thoughts. Community is deepened by sharing with each other what is in our hearts. We invite people now to type your joys and concerns into the chat as the song plays. We also recognize and cherish the joys and concerns that remain in our hearts. Please join in reciting the affirmation while remaining on mute. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection. Lisa froze up there for a second. That's loving affection and trusting hope. There we go. That last week, if you attended the national service, you would have heard Reverend Dan speak about the Canadian Unitarian Council Sharing Our Faith Fund. The Sharing Our Faith Fund is a program of the Canadian Unitarian Council supporting projects that enhance ministry, growth, and outreach for congregations and for the Unitarian Universalist movement in Canada. It is designed to encourage greater associational awareness in our congregations, the fostering of relationships, and a sense of community and connection among and between our member congregations and communities. 
Each year, this fund is renewed with money collected by congregations at special dedicated services and from a foundation fund administered by the First Unitarian Congregation of Toronto. These donations are sent to the CUC to be distributed as grants to congregations applying for projects they may not otherwise afford. Since 2001, through the generosity of our congregations and members, the Sharing Our Faith program has awarded over $200,000 to congregations. Past initiatives include support for part-time professional ministry, communication, publicity, and increasing visibility, whether through signage or social media or web presence. Things like religious education, youth, or music programs. Not long ago, this congregation received a grant to help us purchase hardware that we used to help nudge us toward the digital age. We had no idea when we started creating screen tools for our Sunday services, how valuable that would be when suddenly all of our gatherings would be online. Today's collection will also be directed to the Canadian Unitarian Council sharing our faith fund. If you contributed last week, we thank you. If you weren't at that service, you have another opportunity to help out this worthwhile program. We are inviting you this morning to do whatever you can to give in the spirit of growth, in the spirit of reach, in the spirit of hope to help your neighbors grow, to help all of us grow. So here are the methods. They are also on your screen. Go directly to the Canadian Unitarian Council website, cuc.ca. You can click donate and choose sharing our faith from the many worthy choices. Alternatively, you can send an e-transfer to info at cuc.ca. Please be sure to give your contact information for tax receipts and mark your contributions, sharing our faith and Westwood. If you would rather have Westwood handle it for you, you can send a check or e-transfer to Westwood marked sharing our faith and your contact information and Elaine will send it along for you. Thank you for your annual support of our communities of faith. Blessed be. You can now sing me off Valentine's Day. This Sunday coincides with a holiday that typically is centered on romantic love and in recent years has been reimagined with some success to also include platonic love, friendship, our pals, as well as our intimate partners to be more inclusive and have a further reach. It's the holiday when the price of roses escalates to, and when restaurants are booked solid, second only to Mother's Day and when anticipation and disillusionment tend to walk a tenuous tightrope. Instead of talking about Valentine's and romantic things, we thought today we would talk about commitments on a parallel theme, but something that speaks to our relationship in religious community, as well as our uh, experiences in our own lives. And if you'll take a look at the slide that's showing, um, it's an image from Unsplash by an artist who uses the name My Life Through a Lens. And this is what really sums up what I think of commitments, that together we create. All of us make commitments, whether we are coupled or tripled or partnered or not. We make commitments to ourselves, to one another, to our faith traditions, to our workplaces, to our goals and dreams, to our families. Each of us understands commitment a little differently. So today we're going to have an opportunity to reflect on the kinds of commitments that matter in our lives, that have taught us things, what it is, in commitment that works for us and how we might apply those things to the other experiences that are important to us. We're going to sum it up by looking at how that might inform our faith tradition and the work we do together. 
so today, uh, three times I'm going to invite you to type into the chat. I want you to think about what kind of commitments have been central to your life. What kind of commitments have been central to your life? Now, they don't have to be commitments that worked out to have been central to your life. Sometimes the big important lessons we get are from commitments that we couldn't keep or that someone else didn't keep or that didn't work out. What commitments have you made in your life or been a part of that have had a solid impact on you? And I'm gonna read you some verses again from our opening song and you're invited to type into the chat what kind of commitments have been central to your life? When the fire of commitment sets our mind and soul ablaze, when our hunger and our passion meet to call us on our way, when we live with deep assurance of the flame that burns within, then our promise finds fulfillment and our future can begin. So I'm going to read some of these commitments that are here. There's so much gratitude. I'm so happy for all the gratitude this morning and all the connection. My commitment to my children has been central to me. Commitment to employment. People come first, then other stuff. Commitment to social justice. Commitment to my work with students and working to resolve environmental problems. Family, my profession and work colleagues, Westwood. Commitment to living the Unitarian Universalist principles. 50 years of marriage. I wanna woohoo that one, right? That's a long commitment. Employment at a seniors facility and father care to my students my kiddos, family chosen as well as biological, Westwood, reconciliation and racial justice, disability community and advocacy and my own well-being. Marriage, children, friends, Unitarian Universalist community, Ikebana. Children, yes, Westwood. To my mother and father, sisters, friends who are like family, husband, husband's family, the young staff on the small nonprofit I run, family and community. To be a decent person, marriage, children, and service through work. Still continuing learning and to my pets, marriage, family, faith, community, justice. Right now, marriage children, family, friends, youth, freedom, my profession, creation's web. Commitment to building a better future for everyone, to authenticity and healing, education, teaching, spiritual growth. Commitment to the memory of those no longer with me. Thank you, everybody. Feel free to continue to add to the list as we go on. I want you to choose any one commitment that you have made in your life that you feel worked well. And I want you to focus on what it was that made it work. And a common theme in our lives is that although we make commitments, I mean, we know the joke about, I mean, it's not a joke, but about how people make new year resolutions and January 18th is broken resolution day because that is the average day when uh, people throw their hands in the air and carry on. So sometimes we make commitments to ourselves, but they don't stick. So what makes a commitment stick or makes a commitment have value for you? So I'm gonna talk about a couple of things and tell a story and you can watch for that um, in your mind and in your memory as I'm going. I like to tell a story about writing a paper about 25 years ago 
uh, entitled Marriage is an Empty Contract. It was for a uh, Christian ethics class and they really didn't like my title, but it worked out in the end. When people get married, you are making a binding contract. And yet there are no terms spelled out in the document. You sign a document that says that you are married but it doesn't say what that means. Now, in your marriage ceremony, especially if it's a religious ceremony, some of those things may have been named. You may have named them in your vows. People typically promise things like support and caring. Um, many people commit to till death do us part, although more and more often that's not a part of a ceremony. Sometimes people are getting married with an eye to that commitment might not necessarily be lifelong, but it is for now. Some people promise fidelity. Some people don't. There are all kinds of things that we promise in our minds or that we expect of the other person, but they are not named in the contract. So if you think about it, in a, in a business sense, if you were going into partnership with someone to open a restaurant, say, would you sign a contract that had no terms? I wouldn't. And yet we do that all the time with many of our commitments. Marriage is just one example, but often when we make a commitment to ourselves or to our loved ones, there aren't named terms. And terms and agreements, those, those sometimes seem like words we don't want to think about when we're thinking about relationship. But when we make a commitment, all of those terms and agreements are implied. The tricky thing about a marriage ceremony is that you might have different terms and agreements in your minds. And the task of being in relationship, in any relationship, is to understand the expectations the other person has and where you can meet them or not, how you will live into them or not, how you will help one another get your needs met, if not by yourself, by someone else. Someone else might be the person that helps us do the books. Someone else might be the person that comes in and cleans because neither one of us wanted to do it and we thought the other one was going to. We renegotiate our agreements as we go along. In a law class I took in high school, the man teaching it told us that the biggest mistake people make in a business partnership agreement is that they do not include how to get out of it. They don't put in the terms of leaving. Who gets what, how that works. And he would argue that Businesses tend to last longer if you are clear about not only how you get in and how you will operate, but also how you get out. Because people have a clear understanding, it means they've thought through all the possibilities. And one of the challenges is that we don't want to think about things ending. We like to think about things being forever, but how many restaurants do you know that stayed forever? Just using that as today's example. So when people have written in how one partner can leave and the other one can continue or how they can dissolve the partnership and what happens to the shares, then it makes for a much more amicable relationship because there is no fear and doubt about what comes next. So we think about people in relationships and they make commitments in terms of a of a like a prenuptial agreement. And so many of us think how unromantic that is and how untrusting that is. But by this other practice, it's actually an experience of clarity. We've thought about what's important to us, what brings us together, what binds us together, what is not acceptable to us, and how we can end well. Because if it's not an ending well, you shouldn't be signing that document.
So we talked about partnership in a business relationship between people. There's also ownership. Ownership is a commitment. And I know none of us like to think of it that way about our beloved pets, but that's actually the category in law that they fall under is that you own a pet. And how many of us have entered into that commitment without actually making a choice, the choice made us. That beautiful fuzzy face looked at us and we melted and suddenly we were a family. And then there are all the pieces to that commitment that we may not necessarily have thought through. Isn't that what we try to do with our children? Helping them understand all the pieces of the commitment. Well, you know you're going to have to feed it and walk it and clean up after it. All of these pieces. Or we buy a house and the refrigerator breaks or the roof leaks. And the commitment can be bigger than what we ever thought it was. And when I went to buy my first car, my father said to me, you can't afford to buy a car. And I said, are you kidding me? I've got more than the money it costs to buy this car and put the insurance on it. And I have a job and I can pay insurance. And he said, how will you replace the tires? What will you do when something breaks? Do you know you have to change the oil and get a tune-up. That was back in the days of regular tune-ups. And I hadn't thought of any of those things. And it took me another year before I could afford to own a car. And thank goodness, because otherwise it probably would have sat somewhere waiting for a repair for a really long time. There is a... There is a folklore that says that second marriages, people try harder because they have learned important lessons in the first one. And sometimes we learn lessons in a relationship that didn't go the way we hoped it did, whether that's business or social or family. We learn important lessons from the things that go awry. I know one of the messages that really came home for me that I carry into the marriage I plan to have for the rest of my life is that you always have to keep foremost the idea that you want it to last. That every interaction you make, if you want it to last, that has to be first in your heart and in your thinking. So sometimes when we're tired and snarky, I know that happens to me, if we enter into a conversation not remembering that our intention is for this to last, we're actually bringing about the opposite effect. And when we start entering into conversations from a defensive place, we're already creating the ending. The last thing on my list is growth and change. And thinking back to that marriage being an empty contract, I mean, maybe one of the ways that that does work is that we don't stay the same over the course of any relationship, of any partnership. And you can think about that in work settings that the technology we used at one point might have been a pen and paper, and now it's a computer, and now it's Zoom. I remember working in restaurants for years where everything was written down on paper and hung on a hook, all the orders, right? And now they use computers to type it all in, and it all comes up on a screen in the kitchen. If we have too tight a grip on what our commitments are, then they hold us back because we are always changing and growing. I know what 12-year-old me thought was a great life is nothing like what 25-year-old me thought was a great life, which is nothing like this me thinks is a great life. The world changes and we change. So thinking about 
<clears throat> commitments that you've been in, whether they worked or didn't, what were the important pieces about them? Not the commitment itself, but what were the tools or lessons that either made it work or that you learned you would need to use in the future? So my example was you always need to keep foremost the outcome that you have in mind. And that we can't stand still, we need to be able to negotiate a change in terms as our lives and the world changes. What practical skills or characteristics have you learned about making commitments work? You can type those into the chat now. So we've got any course of study is a commitment, learning an instrument or a language you cannot become proficient without investing daily and regularly right? That investment of time and effort. Communicating boundaries and needs clearly in all relationships. Communication. Taking risks, perseverance, learning from failure and trying again. Keeping my eye on the prize. Avoid overextending myself patience and forgiveness of myself and others, a willingness to work through the hard spots, respect the golden rule. Honesty is very important. Flexibility, compassion, love, passion and perseverance. I think we have a spell check in here that I'm not sure what it means. It says treating it as Adobe decision. <laughs> Relationship with children and spouse. Taking the time I need to spend with my own creativity. A done decision. That's the correction on the, on the auto correct in there. Treating it as a done decision. Circling back to correct poor judgment. Don't we all have poor judgment at some times? Open communication, listening as well as speaking, commitment, respect, and the seven teachings. Be a joiner, but constantly review whether the commitment is working out and whether I'm pulling my weight. Learning that commitment is something which may or may not be unconditional. Indeed. Admitting frankly when you're just not at your best. Spending more time listening than speaking in conflict resolution. Adapt and adapt again. Our word is our bond willing to be vulnerable and have your heart broken. Yeah. What does commitment mean for Unitarian Universalists as a faith tradition? I had the pleasure last weekend and the challenge really to attend uh, what we call UMOC West, where the ministers of Western Canada gather in a retreat, uh, typically held on Vancouver Island. And I can't always travel to get there, but it was on Zoom. So I could get there and amen for Zoom because it has opened my options and possibilities so much. And the other good thing about it was that because we could meet on Zoom, we could have a speaker that would have been very expensive and at this point in time impossible to bring across the border. So Leslie Takahashi joined us, the Reverend Leslie Takahashi joined us. She was a key participant for the Commission on Institutional Change of the Unitarian Universalist Association. So our national association's Canadian Unitarian Council in the US, it's the Unitarian Universalist Association, and we are closely tied and we learn from one another. And while our lived experiences are not exactly the same, our lessons are often very parallel. And the commission 
was commissioned to create a report uh, in response to some incidents of anti-racism, but that was the beginning commission. And then it was expanded to include a wider understanding of our faith tradition. The report they issued is called Widening the Circle of Concern. Widening the Circle of Concern. You can find it free as a PDF on the UUA website. The other document that we looked at that weekend is a Canadian document from the Canadian Unitarian Council. We had a dismantling racism study group last year who did a report. That's the CUC dismantling racism study group report available as a PDF on the Canadian Unitarian Council website, cuc.ca. Tied into both of these are the idea of an eighth principle in Unitarian Universalism. And some of you will be familiar with this. And for some of you, this will be new. And I just welcome you into this idea. I'm going to read you the proposed eighth principle. If you're new here, we operate with seven principles. We call our tradition a living tradition in that nothing is set in stone. It's always changing. Change doesn't always come quickly. But like when we learned more about inclusive language, we changed the language in our principles. We changed the gender pronouns. We changed it um, from the language originally that was, was all masculine language representing everybody. And when we have a learning that something is important, then we shift and we grow. So there is a proposal for an eighth principle. It's being studied in the United States. I think it's going to come to a vote this year nationally. Um, and it was the impetus for the CUC Dismantling Racism Group to look at. Here is the eighth principle. And it uses the Unitarian Universalist Association as the name in the beginning. But in Canada, we when we adopt things, we change them to say the Canadian Unitarian Council. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. And I read that again. Journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. There are all kinds of opinions on this principle. It doesn't exactly match the poetry of our first seven. It's action oriented more than philosophical. It's a strong commitment. If you wanna know more about it, it was proposed by Black Lives UU. And there you just type in eighth principle project. Because it has taken so long and some congregations are eager to adopt it, many congregations have adopted it already for use on their own. In my heart, I have adopted it already. The next time you see our Rainbow People story characters, there will be an eighth character. I invite you to work with this and learn about it and see what it means for you. Three things that Leslie lifted up for us from the work that created the widening the circle of concern are these. That we need to learn from our ancestors that sometimes when we are in a difficult spot, like we are with truth, healing, and reconciliation, 
with Black Lives Matter, with any anti-racism program where we might want to distance ourselves from the past, from the people who came before us, from our ancestors. We need to learn from our ancestors. That even though everything they said and did may not be ideal, there is still wisdom there. From the light of days remembered burns a beacon bright and clear, guiding hands and hearts and spirits into faith set free from fear. The second is that we need to strengthen our theology in a liberatory way. If our theology is not a theology of liberation, it is not relevant in the world. And a, th a theology of liberation speaks to marginalized and oppressed people that they are worthy, that there is hope, that there is place for them in our community, that we care about their community that they don't need to look or be exactly like us to be welcome here until all of us are free, none of us are free. And that we should use our principles for reparation, which heightens the need for the eighth principle. From the stories of our living rings a song, both brave and free, calling pilgrims still to witness, to the life of liberty. The third item is that we need to widen our circle of concern, inclusive of age, race, identity, ways of being. And by shifting our focus from just exactly what we are in this moment to a wider circle of concern, we revive and renew ourselves and our faith tradition. Think about the energy that little people bring into the room. How much joy we get from a little one's laughter and happiness. Think about the wisdom and teaching coming from our young people, our young adults, who are so far ahead of us in understanding current cultural shifts and changes. How our young people have labored with us to help us understand pronouns, oppression, racism. Think about the gifts of our seniors, the people who built our congregations, who have kept them alive and are still in many cases holding the weight of the work to keep them going. And all of us in between there, with all of our lessons and our oppressions and our understandings and our questions and our curiosity and our gifts. And when we widen our circle of concern, it shifts everything, both inside of us and beyond. I know Westwood has a new chalice circle that just formed, focused on reconciliation. widening our circle of concern. From the dreams of youthful vision comes a new prophetic voice, which demands a deeper justice built by our courageous choice, rallying our resources for a wider circle of concern is an investment in our collective future. What commitments this is your last invitation. What commitments can you imagine that we can make either as a faith tradition or you as a member or a participant in our faith tradition? What commitments can you imagine to transform our faith tradition 
into greater relevance to live our principles in a most essential way to widen our circle of concern. Two people have typed, I commit to this principle, meaning the eighth principle in my heart and mind. The commitments you name may be things we already do that we need to remind ourselves of. To listen came up. We can make a commitment to protect our planet, amen. With no planet, nothing else is of any value. I commit to keep challenging my biases. I can't type and talk at the same time, but I commit to understanding the characteristics and the antidotes to white supremacy as they relate to me and my behaviors. And I commit to an attempt that will be flawed, but I'm doing my best to decolonize the compliments lecture. Commitment to support the disadvantaged. Yes, I'm realizing more and more that there are assumptions that I've lived by in good faith that are not helpful and I'm learning to let them go. Me too. To be more open and honest about our failings so that we can move on. To smash colonialism. Committing to the eighth principle, to listen to gender justice and to pluralistic community. To focus my energy for social justice work on issues that affect oppressed people near me. I commit to keep challenging my biases. I commit to compassion for self and others as we embark on our journey together. We won't get through this without compassion. Our unofficial theme this year has been compassionate imperfection, that in all our messiness, we learn and grow together. Yes, to smash colonialism, I second that. I'm gonna close with the words of Richard S. Gilbert, one of our wise UU elders still with us, a leader in compassionate ministry. Oh, there's another one, I commit to committing, amen. And Richard Gilbert is, has been, for his whole ministry, an effective champion of social justice. It comes from the book, We Pledge Our Hearts, which is a book that we often use in planning marriage ceremonies. And I love that there are justice readings in the wedding book. We meet on holy ground brought into being as life encounters life, as personal histories merge into the communal story, as we take on the pride and pain of our companions, as separate selves become community. How desperate is our need for one another, our silent beckoning to our neighbors, our invitation to share life and death together our welcome into the lives of those we meet and their welcome into our own. May our souls capture this treasured time. May our spirits celebrate our meeting in this time and in this space, for we meet on holy ground. Richard Gilbert. How desperate is our need for one another. We have learned this, this year in ways we never could have imagined. May we widen our circle of concern that it might expand to be limitless, to love and support us all. Blessed be and amen. Our final hymn this morning is Fire of Commitment played by Sheila.
Thank you, Sheila, for that. Sheila wrote to me that said there were so many notes and so many words, she couldn't do both at the same time. So I hope you sang along in your hearts or in your mouths with gusto for that beautiful song. I want to say before closing words that I see lots of new faces in the room today, and I hope that you will stay and say hello at the end of the service because I'd really love to welcome you. And if you have to run, there are two ways you can get best connected with Westwood. One is to go to the website and subscribe and then you'll get the updates in your email. And the other is to write to our Westwood office, info at westwoodunitarian.ca and ask to be put on the mailing list. There are two different ways that we communicate with folks. And if you wanna know what's going on and if you want to be found, one of those ways would be the best. When the fire of commitment sets our minds and souls ablaze, when our hunger and our passion meet to call us on our way, when we live with deep assurance of the flame that burns within, then our promise finds fulfillment and our future can begin. One of the best ways to make a commitment come true is to commit it to someone else. Research shows that when you share your commitments with someone else, you have a much higher result of success. And if you share them specifically, you name the agreements and the plans and you commit them with a timeline that goes way up too. So while we grab our chalices and extinguish our flames, we hold our commitments in our hearts and we hold them in the love of community. We hold one another because together we are stronger and together we can help one another to widen our circle of concern. Blessed be. I want to lift up next week's service before I send people into breakout rooms. Do that. Tell us about next week's service. All Amara. right. Next week's service, we have a guest speaker who is a local rock star named Emmett Michael. And he's a friend of mine that I met through Pyros, um, the organization which Avery Edwards runs. Prairie Youth Radical Organizing School. That's the one. And he is trans and Christian and has done a lot of inner work on bringing those two things together. And he is a lovely speaker and also a fabulous musician. So he's our guest musician and he's going to play us a few extra songs and it's going to be a rock star morning. And we're just so glad to have you here with us this morning.